Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Automated Exploratory Testing, Automation of Native app, Mobile Apps with Senior Software Engineer Justin Ison. Before he takes center stage, here are five things that you probably did not know about Justin. One, Justin is a Senior Success Engineer at Apply Tools. Two, before he joined Apply Tools, he was Senior Software Engineer at Microsoft Berlin, where he worked on the Wanderlist app. Three, he has nine, over 19 years of experience in software quality, with the last eight years primarily focusing on developing API, web, and mobile test automation. Four, he's an accomplished public speaker and has presented in leading testing and automation conferences. And the last one was STPCon Spring in Newport Beach just last month, I think. And five, he is one of the nicest people you will ever have the pleasure of meeting. So I think it's best to let him speak now. Um, Justin, take it away from here. Oh, thank you, Addy, with your kind words. Uh, yeah, so hello, everyone. Yeah, as Addy said, my name is Justin Nyson. I am a senior software engineer and customer success at Apple Tools. And essentially, my role at Apple Tools is I assist our customers with onboarding with uh, the Apple Tools SDK, SDKs and uh, helping them in recommending best practices for automation. And then to, today I'm going to talk to you about automated exploratory testing of native mobile applications and the journey I went through of building a crawler application. So what I'll talk about, you know, I'll talk, I'll cover, you know, today's quick development landscape, you know, with CI and CD and Agile. You know, the, the complex combinations of um, for the mobile test matrix and all the things that need to be validated. Showing you how we can leverage machines to do some of the things that us humans would normally would do, that we would spend hours doing so. And the solution I came up with and how I did it. And how automating exploratory testing can help you find more bugs in the short release cycles that we have today in today's development world. So the agile world moves fast and it's up to us to keep up, you know, especially in mobile, you know, and with CI and CD continuous deployment, the time to market is becoming increasingly shorter. You know, when I first started my career, it was normal to have two to three months iterations. And now we're lucky to have two to three or even four day um, uh, release cycles or even sometimes several within one day. You know, it's because of this, you know, companies, you know, want to continuously push out new features to keep ahead of competition or uh, release any bug fi fixes. You know, I'm seeing more and more companies in today's world are adopting a QA-less environment, you know, requiring um, developers to test as well. So not only do they have to develop the application, they have to test the application as well. Depending on what you believe, you know, these are two different um, careers. You know, and because of this, I'm seeing usually a lot of time, less time is being allocated to exploratory and manual testing of your application. You know, I see many companies, big and small, are relying more and more on end users or customers to report any uh, issues that it, uh, encounter. You know, I see it all the time. I have applications on my phone or on my computer, and I see issues that could have probably been caught, but instead I'm seeing them and um, I report them to uh, the software vendor. I see some companies are reliant solely on telemetry or analytics to provide information. So they're not even doing test automation or any type of automation. They do a lot of telemetry, which telemetry is great. It's a very powerful tool and very important, but it has its purpose. Problem with analytics is you're only going to get so much from it. You're not going to get UI, langu language, um, or design flaws from analytics. And relying solely on these approaches is not very good practice. It only opens you up to scrutiny and poor opinions about your software quality. And in my opinion, there's just not enough software options available to us in today's market to help fill these quality gaps because of this quick and shortened release time. So my goal was to automate exploratory testing of native applications the best I could possibly do, trying to come up with every possible scenario that I normally would do if I was going to test it manually myself. 
So I wanted to put the machines to work, you know, create a crawler application to collect as much metadata about my application as possible and report back all its fi findings on every build that was produced. You know, know something, you know, something that could help fill these quality gaps that I mentioned before in such the shortened release time that we have now. And just know more about my application on every build and keep a history of it so I could benchmark benchmark it and um, query it later if I need to. You know, I want to capture all the elements on every view and know which um, elements have accessibility labels. So for our visually impaired users, it's, this is important. So knowing which have accessibility labels and do not is important. And then capture unique images on every view. So I want to um, capture these images for every re resolution, every orientation, and then provide a simple solution for everybody to easily see what that current application looks like on every build. So instead of opening and installing the app themselves, they could just go into a web service and see these images and see what the application looked like in that current state or that current build. And then uh, capture any errors or exceptions that occur, detect languages or locale issues that may occur on my application, capture performance data. So performance is important and it's something that we, we should always do as part of development and automation and testing. And I'll cover that in a little bit later. And generate unique telemetry data. So I, like I mentioned before, telemetry has its purpose. It's very important. And just using testing your telemetry using the same type of test, tests with expected results every time um, is not going to uh, create a robust, robust telemetry framework, in my opinion. But if you can generate unique telemetry data, you can make your um, analytics much more robust and powerful and give you the information you need. And then I want the ability to replay a crawl after a code fix. So as my crawler is going through and reporting any findings and any issues it encounters, I want to be able to re replay back that um, those steps and see if any issues, see if the issue is resolved. And then I wanted to create something that didn't care about the app's current state. Just like if I handed you the application and said, go ahead and test it, I wanted to re uh, reproduce that same effect in an automated way. And then be, be cross-platform. I wanted to build something with one framework, which I'm using Appium, and Appium can support both Android and iOS. So I wanted to do something that could be cross-platform. So what is an app crawler? An app crawler as much is like a you know it's so much like a web crawler, spider robot if you've heard those before those terms. And it's a program designed to emulate human uh, interactions on the UI, much like a person would. But before we can begin, what led me here? So I worked for a company that was very big on dog food in our. Uh, own applications. For those of you that don't know what dog fooding is, it's essentially an interesting term that is um, testing your own application internally amongst the, your, the people in your company. However, we had a slight problem with this is because majority of our users in the company were Apple fans. So our iOS and Mac apps got the most tested and the most comments back and data back from our users. And so our less popular platforms suffered because of this. And unfortunately, some um, errors were released to production, which otherwise should have been caught. You know, we also had a very small QA team, which also had to do support. And the amount of exploratory manual testing needed to cover all the our different platforms on each release as we're con continuously building new uh, builds was impossible for them to, main to keep up. And sometimes the wrong designs were being implemented or no longer preferred, preferred. And we found out late in the process, thus costing us time and money. So if we were able to capture, catch these things before that ever made it to this point before release, we would have saved ourselves time and effort. And constantly fixing and revising tests due to code and design changes. So 
I'm pa passionate about automation across the whole testing uh, pyramid or whatever paradigm you believe in, whether it's a snowman or upside down um, ice cream cone. It, there was only so much you could do where if your designs and, and application are changing that you spent hours and hours revising your, your, your tests automation scripts to only have them break again because of these changes. So I thought there had to be a better way. So the mobile test matrix, we need some more help from the machines. So you have device orientations. You know, majority of the people only test their application in the port portrait orientation. It makes sense. It's what how your application fits um, in your the palm of your hand, or sorry, how your device fits in the palm of your hand. But if your application supports both orientations, it's important that you verify that the usability and design works in both landscape and portrait. You know, what happens when you do rotate your screen? In this case, this application, the screen went blank. So had it not, had it been tested before it ever was released, you would, you would hopefully have caught it before it was pushed to production. So device resolutions. There's several different resolutions out there now. You know, you have Retina, you have different sizes, you have iPads, phablets, and even small phones. And it's only growing. Every every day there's a new device coming out. So how do you know your design and is going to look and your application is going to work correctly on every re resolution you support unless you actually test it? You know, most people, myself included, is, are guilty of this, is they only test with the devices that and resolutions that are available to them. But if you don't test the other devices, how will you actually know? You know, hopefully this doesn't happen to you. You know, this the developer or whoever made this application assumed that the device that would render this had a higher resolution, but in this case it wasn't, or it looks like an egg. And then there's many OS versions. <clears throat> you know, Android alone has over 17 versions now, and that's growing. But how will you know your app will look and function and behave on every OS version you support? You know. Majority of people only test the device operating systems that are available to them, but you need to test all of them if you if your application supports that. Languages. So you can see the theme here is, you know, how will your app behave and work in all the different languages that in locales that you support? Majority of people only test in their native native tongue, which makes sense because if you don't speak German or if, or if you don't speak Arabic. You would probably never put the application in those languages because one, it would be difficult to navigate because you don't know what the buttons in the UI says, and you just feel comfortable speak, um, testing the language that you know. But how will your designs and languages uh, um, work for languages such as um, Arabic and Hebrew, whereas Western languages are from left to right and Arabic and Hebrew are from right to left? So developer designer may may make assumptions that the uh, that the design will always be in a Western language, but your layout and your application could totally break if you switch it to these other languages. And how will you know if your language or your or if your layout will break if you switch to language that has predominantly longer strings, such as German? A word in English may be only five characters long, but then when you switch it to German, it may be 15 characters long and break your layout of your view. So test overload, you know, there's so much to do and so little time to do it. You know, how are you gonna know your application is gonna work correctly and all these different combinations if your release cycle is, you know, shortened to like several, if you're releasing several times a day or several times a week and you have even less resources. You know, a lot of companies I worked for in the past have been startups and we, you know, we're usually resource limited, so we don't have several QA, or we don't have several um, people to go around and test all these combinations. You know, you could possibly do this with UI test automation of all these scenarios. But then again, UI automation only tests what it's programmed to test. You know, you, you create um, an expectation, and then you assert that expectation. But with crawling, 
you are testing the unexpected. You're testing things that you don't normally, you're, you're gonna write a test for because it's gonna hopefully catch things that you didn't account. You know, you if you were gonna go through this path of doing it with UI automation, you would need an army of engineers to code all these different possible scenarios. Or if you could, you hire an army of zombie testers which will never sleep and they will test your application forever and ever if you can control them. And if you by chance did pull it off and automated all these different combinations, your, your test automation would be impossible to maintain whenever a change would make because you would have thousands of lines of code that would have to be updated whenever something changed. So, it just couldn't be that hard were my famous last words. As I was getting into this, it was kind of giving, I'm gonna kind of go over, you know, what all the things you have to account for when you're developing something like this. You know, I first thought, I was like, oh, I'll just launch the app, I'll grab, you know, I'll parse the DOM, grab all the different elements and I'll loop through them. Well, that was actually the easiest part. You know, the hard part is actually handling all the different conditionals and unknown edge cases that could occur. Especially when you're adapting, uh, you're trying to create one application to work or create one crawler to work with all the different applications and different UI flows. Yeah, so what I had to figure out was like, how do I detect only the unique locators, the, the locators that are visible on the top layer of the UI that only a human can see? Unfortunately, a lot of the SDKs, you get back a bunch of locators or a bunch of elements, but um, there's only certain elements that are visible to the top layer of the UI. And then how do I rescue the app if the application gets stuck? You know, if the application is crawling and gets to a certain view and it can't crawl anymore, you have to add logic to be able to handle it to make it so it gets unstuck. And then what to do if a crash occurs? You know, applications, especially in development, crash all the time, so you have to have logic to handle those cases. And then collecting performance data. So as I mentioned before, I wanted to um, make sure the performance of my application work was correct. And I had to collect this data and then log any errors that occurred, capture only unique screenshots, so I'm not duplicating effort. And then I identify all the accessibility labels. So these are all things I have to find out and capture as part of the metadata. And then how to programmatically detect, detect uh, language issues. You know, as if I'm working on an international um, app that has multiple languages, I need to figure out a way to automate that and give me back the um, languages that are incorrect. And then hybrid web views. You have web, a lot of applications today have web views that um, inside their applications. If you're crawling that application, you go into the web view, you could potentially end up crawling the entire internet if you're not careful, because it may go into that web view and then click a button, which will take you to a web page, and then it'll click, click links in that web page, and then before you know it, you are crawling the entire internet, like I mentioned. And then handling authentication and accidental logout. You know, a lot of applications nowadays have um, authentication, so you have to have logic to handle it and detect if you're on the login page and then log you in, or in case if you accidentally log out to log you back in, or actually exiting the application by mistake. So you have, a, you have to add logic to exclude certain elements from ever being tapped because you want to keep the crawler inside the application and make sure you're collecting as much information about the application as possible without logging out. And then mobile gestures. A lot of applications in today actually use gestures and you need to know when to appropriately use these like force press, swipe up and down, pull to refresh, et cetera. So here is an example of the application crawling in both landscape and portrait. As you can see, hence the name crawl, it's, it's slow, you know, it's crawling, but actually in the background, a lot of things are happening. You know, it's, it's collecting all the metadata, it's get, capturing the screenshot, it's getting the performance, it's capturing the, the, the strings for the language comparison. And so a lot of things are happening, but it just doesn't, you don't actually see it in the UI so much. So captured screenshots. So this is one thing, this is the, the view I wanted to show my people in my organization. 
where they could come in and they could see what the application looks like in portrait and landscape, you know, the different operating systems, and the resolution. So in this case here, it's going to show up. It's going to show a keyboard um, in here in landscape mode, where it's you only see a little um, sliver, and that brings up that's a good um, test because I you know I may not have gone to that particular view and in that particular case where I could actually now go to the developer and say, well, we need to have a better user experience here and change the keyboard, how it works when it's in landscape. In this case, it's in, um, this is a tablet. And you see a lot of the screens here are stretched. So this brings up another good conversation because I could go to the designer or developer and you know suggest that maybe we should you know change the way this works when it's in tablet in a higher resolution device and maybe use a split view. So it's not stretching the, the designs. Here's going to um, application Arabic. This is, you know, one you want to check to make sure that it's not showing um, English strings or any other language strings, which in this case you see there's several cases it is. And then you also want to validate that it's 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 going from right to left instead of left to right. In, in most of the cases, it's incorrect, but in, in one or so, it's actually correct where it's showing from right to left. So accessibility detection, um, very important for visually impaired users to be able to use the application. Accessibility labels tell the visually impaired user what each function does of the UI so they, they know what they're tapping when they do so. And this is also good to know because now I know uh, which um, elements have an accessibility label and which don't. And it raises, um, uh, it gives a way for me to raise this um, to the developer or product owner um, if, if we need to add more. So you can see on the right, the right view has almost every element or object has an accessibility label, but the one on the left only um, has a few. So now I could go to the developer and say, you know, maybe we should add some more, or maybe we should take some away, depending on how, how much we want to add to this. So app performance, you know, you know, it's what I always say is a forgotten test. You know, a lot of people forget to test the performance of your application. But it's imperative because if you have a poor performing application that is slow, you know, nobody's wanting to use it. It may functionally work great, but its performance might be horrible. So it's important that we test this as well. You know, it's it's um, you know, you want to know as much as possible about your application, especially under the hood that you can't see on the UI. And you know, it's not only enough just to do automated tests to ensure quality and cache regressions. You know, specifically, you want to monitor the memory and C CPU and also the application size. You know, it's not only important to capture all this information, but you want to store it for historical lookup and benchmarking to detect any trends. So if you see in your graph that your performance is starting to um, degrade after every build, then you can raise it to the developer and you know, tell them that you're seeing the performance of your application is becoming poorer. So it just raised, it's another way to raise the conversation with the, the, the developer to increase the performance of your application. And going back to application size, and this is important because a lot of application or uh, app stores have hard limits on how large an application can be before you, when you can upload it to the, the store or even downloading it over the air. So knowing what the application size and benchmarking it so you could see if it's trending up, you can raise this conversation to the developer or you can maybe re remove some assets to make the application smaller so it doesn't ever reach these um, thresholds. So here's a performance report. So this is great because after every test run, I can actually get what the performance is of my application and know what my max CPU and max memory is along with the application size. But since I have all the screenshots, I can match it to every data point. So I know exactly what the application was doing at, at that point in the crawl. So I can go back to that particular view and see if I can reproduce and see what's causing this uh, performance issue. And then if, if, if it is a problem, then I can raise it to the developer and uh, create a bug to have it fixed.
So language detection. You know, as you've seen, there are tons and tons of screenshots that are generated for all the different um, combinations of operating systems, landscape and portrait, um, uh, resolutions, you know, scanning, going through each one of these for abnormalities is very time consuming and prone to human mistake. So I thought there had to be a better way uh, of doing this. You know, so I dug into uh, uh, researching all the open source libraries that are out there. You know, I tried several of them. Some of them were actually quite good, but they just didn't work well enough. You know, they would work great if I supplied four or more words in a sentence, but that's not gonna work with an application when one or two word titles are often used. So I ended up using Google Translate API, which by far provided the best results compared to any open source tool that I ever tried. And actually the cost of it is not that much um, either in, in detecting uh, language, it, you're uh, looking for your language issues, you don't actually have to do it on every build, but perhaps before every release, you check it to make sure that the strings are correct. And so here's an example of a report I could generate afterwards um, telling me the, the strings that are incorrect. In this particular case, this is a Spanish, or the application's in Spanish, but there's several English words showing up. So unfortunately, our Spanish users won't you know, know what we're trying to say to them because they don't understand uh, English, maybe. So log monitoring. Um, you know, many errors go unnoticed in the UI. Um, you know, such as network API memory issues that you would never, never see. So it's very important whenever you're doing exploratory, exploratory testing, whether it's manual, manual or even automated, that you actually are monitoring the logs while you do this. You know, you should detect, you know, when they create the crawler and detect any errors and then record them or capture an exception or a crash if it occurs and then shut down all the different processes and take a screenshot whenever an error occurs. So I know exactly what the, where the application was at the particular moment to then go ahead and reproduce it or to see what happened myself. But what about app crashes? How do how can we handle those? In this particular, particular application, it's one I use for um, some of my Appium uh, workshops. It actually has a feature here when you tap this button to actually crash the application. So it's perfect test application for this case. So you see her application crashed and so now so so it now does the crawler. But the nice thing is now I have um, an exception. I could take this to the developer. He could take you know research it and hopefully fix it. And he um, has all the information he needs. I could give him the recording of what happened and a screenshot and show him exactly which button was that actually was tapped to produce the, this issue or what the steps were. So replaying a crawl. So I don't know about you, but many times over my career when I'm doing exploratory testing or, or even manual testing for that matter, I've come across issues or crashes and then I've spent hours trying to reproduce the issue to, and sometimes to no avail. But since this is a machine, it records every single step that it does and then I could easily replay that crawl back. So if it does encounter an issue, I could then replay it to make sure it actually, the crash or issue is repeatable. The next benefit is then I can give the steps to the developer and he could then make a code fix and I can replay that crawl once the code fix has been made to see if it actually is indeed fixed. And then same goes for performance data. I may come across um, some inconsistent or poor performance um, on, a, on a single test run. And then I can actually replay it back again after maybe the developer's done some tweaks to, to the application to see if that actually improves the performance afterwards. Oops. Oops, I meant to play this. There it goes. <clears throat> In this particular case, it's gonna crash again um, because the application is meant to do that. But just shows you that we, because it could record every step, it could go back through each um, 
each uh, step that it did and go back to the end result, which in this case is going to crash. And then crash. So automatic tests. You know, again, reviewing every single screenshot for every single language, every resolution, orientation, became very cumbersome and prone to human mistake. Just natural, you know, going through every screenshot, um, your eyes start getting glossed over and you, you can miss things easily. Um, but the nice thing with the machine is it, it tends to not miss these things. So I thought, you know, is there a way I could actually automate this process? And if so, how? And so after thinking about it, and this is uh, before I joined Apple Tools, I could do this with using Apple Tools. So I could validate, I could set up tests to uh, assert whenever a change happens. And in this case, you could see here, all the, I have uh, five different tests that I've defined that, you know, when you're on this view, um, capture a screenshot and upload it to Apple Tools. And then I could run it across all the different scenarios of all, you know, all the different OS versions, all the different um, resolutions, uh, um, locales, uh, different languages, and then um, orientations. And then the nice thing about this is Apple Tools could then filter back all the results and just tell me which ones have failed instead of me having to review every, you know, thousands of the screenshots that are generated. And then in this case, I was able to fail the test because I actually went and updated the application and changed the, the text of the alert box. And Apple Tools tell, told me that it failed because of that case. And so if I was testing this across all the different combinations, then I could just go to Apple Tools and see which ones actually failed instead of looking at every individual screenshot again. So chaos, every chaos monkey. Sometimes we all need a little chaos. So those of you that may be familiar with um, the Android SDK, it has a monkey tester framework built into it. Well, Appium doesn't have that uh, capability, so I did my best to reproduce it the best I could. And you see here um, on the left is Snapchat, on the right is Twitter, and in the middle are just um, some sample data output that it does when it runs. And you see here, it's just doing random taps and swipes left, up and down, um, to the right and left. And on the right, it's it's about to tweet Best Buy this uh, kitten video. The nice thing about this is it's it's actually good because you could actually tie this to performance testing because you could actually um, essentially load test your application, see so you know take it to um, to its point to see like what you can do to make it crash. So the applications aren't built to take all this random data, um, potentially, depending on the application. So you, you could stress it out to see if you could actually um, un under uncover an issue, whether, whether it's a crash or a performance issue. So these are also good techniques to do to make sure your application is solid. So let it run for a little bit longer, but you can see here on uh, Snapchat on the left, there's all these random taps, and then the, the lines are um, swipe left and right and pull to refresh. And I actually got Snapchat to crash with this. So this just only reaffirmed my belief that, you know, adding a crawler or a monkey tester to your development process for ex exploratory testing actually can uncover issues that you normally wouldn't have caught, you know, with traditional test automation, which is writing expectations and then asserting those expectations. This is testing the unexpected. So some interesting moments. You know, um, when you first create a Twitter account, your Twitter geolocates you, and since you don't have any, um, you're not having any followers at the time, it geolocates you and inputs people in your area into your feed. However, the problem with when you run a crawler on this is, um, in my case, it actually put my local police department 
as one of um, the people in my Twitter feed. And before I knew it, when I walked away and came back, I actually had tweeted the police department a couple of times of random uh, hipster gibberish. Um, I say hipster because that's the language library I use to help me identify right away if, if it's the crawler that generated text or not. So I quickly deleted those tweets and unfollowed the tweet police department. And uh, you just have to be careful. You probably shouldn't use your personal account like I did when running a crawler. Um, the other application that I used to, um, to build this was uh, WordPress. And as it's going through different um, people's blogs and um, leaving comments, I actually had people coming back to me and writing some rather unique language comments back to me. So things I can't share. And so conclusion, you know, hopefully I actually have shown you the benefits um, of adding a crawler or monkey tester to your development and testing process. You know, why, you know, there is a need for us to leverage machines and to help us, you know, to help us more. You know, I built this because I wanted this to exist and thought it should exist because I needed the help. Um, you know, the main reason I actually am and sharing, you know, the, this experience is because, um, you know, we need more options like this to help us move quicker, especially in the CI, CD world. Um, and I hope others create something similar or create something identical because it needs it needs to be out there. We, we need these we need these tools. You know, I will be at open source in this. Um, so if you are interested, you know, please reach out to me on Twitter and email me if you're interested in, in contributing. Um, the only problem is I have very little uh, bandwidth, and when I have time, I work on this. And but it will be released soon. And I do believe with the rate of technology changes, you know, app crawling could be the future of UI automation or some form of it. You know, I see it firsthand um, for the company I work with, with Apple Tools, with uh, machine learning and AI space in, in our sector now. It's, it's rapidly growing and the things in this area, I could, I could see that um, will take the form of UI automation or help assist and make uh, testing much easier and more powerful. So thank you. Is there any questions, Addy? Yeah, we actually have quite a few. Uh, first of all, thank you. I think that the most important thing that I learned from today's session is to keep you as far away as possible from Apple Tools Twitter account. Um, <laughs> and uh, to the questions. So first one, how is this testing technique different from API testing? Uh, well, this is testing the UI. So this is... You know, this is testing the UI. This is a full integration test. So you're testing how the the native components work with the uh, API that's getting the information from the web services, and how it um, it's a whole full circle test. So you're not only seeing what your application renders like on the UI and all the different resolutions and languages and orientations, you're not just getting a payload and testing what you would do at the API level. Next question. Uh, you mentioned DOM. Does a crawl support shadow DOM? Does it? Um, well, it depends. I mean, so this is a native application, which shadow DOMs, um, unless they're on maybe a hybrid web view, um, you you wouldn't you wouldn't have to deal with. Um, it's it's potential that if shadow DOMs actually there is a lot of libraries even like Selenium. And even uh, Appium, which is built on top of Selenium, you don't, you can't easily get access to the Shadow DOM elements. You have to use different libraries to do that. Um, so answer is, I don't think it really applies in my case, but um, no. <laughs> also, if, if you came across it, probably you would run into problems with Shadow DOM. Uh, next question. Justin, can I give you the next yep, question? Yep. Yep, uh, okay, great. Uh, what was the tool used for visual representation of performance of the app? Uh, so the visual uh, representation was just something I built. 
Um, I got all the performance. So with the Android SDK, you can actually, it has an API where you could actually do calls to get what the current CPU is of the application, of what the CPU is of the device, and several different um, uh, performance um, values. And then I just took those values and generated a graph based on, you know, put them into a, a JSON and then generated a graph off of that. But once this is all, um, when I open source this, you could actually see how that logic works. So if, if you want to know more, you can uh, send me an email or uh, tweet me, and I can follow up with you about it. OK. How could you provide data to the crawler in case some custom transition is needed, for example, entering text? Yes, so that's a good point. So you. Um, so there's no crawler you can ever build, at least in my opinion, and I'd be happy if other people have a different opinion about this, that you could just build and it'll work out of the box. You have to have some type of configuration file to tell it, you know, one, you know, which application to run and launch. But then like you ask the obviously tell it, like if you have a login authentication, you're gonna tell it what your username and password is to um, log in. In this case, you use a configuration file to tell it, you know, on this element, you could fill in this string if you encounter it. Oh. Next question. Justin? Yep, sorry, go on. Uh, okay, oh, no, no. Um, you mentioned it before, but I just wanted to, um, just to, um, to, uh, to just to make sure that people are clear. Uh, so the question was, is the crawler an open source project? And if so, uh, is it possible to join the team building it? So if you want to say a few more, more words about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, not yet, but it will be soon, as I mentioned. So the problem with, you know, and I have other open source projects, is just finding the time to do it. I've, I've spent the last couple of months rewriting everything to make the code as clean as possible to read. And the only thing I have left now is to update the readme. Um, so I could give you step-by-step -step instructions how to start it, but I would love the help. So if you please just reach out to me on Twitter or on my email, I will uh, send you all the information once it's released or I'll, I'll tweet it to everybody once I, once I do. Great. So next question, um, can you can we use it for testing uh, web applications? Uh, currently, not yet. Uh, if you're testing, a, I mean, it depends what, if you're talking about mo mobile web. It, it will be possible, but I didn't build it to test mobile web. It built it to test native applications. Um, there are crawler applications already out there, open sourced, or even ones you, you could buy on the market to test desktop um, web applications. So that's what I would recommend. If you just do a Google search or go to GitHub and search for it, you should be able to find some good alternatives. Next question. Uh, are you using Appium for this? I am using Appium, yeah. So it, under the hood is Appium. And the nice thing about Appium, it's cross-browser. So, or sorry, cross-platform. So I can, in theory, write everything in one one uh, language, and then be able to test both um, iOS and Android. And then, you know, now, um, not, I guess it's been over a year, but uh, Windows desktop application has support now with Appium, and then even uh, Mac desktop applications you can automate with Appium. So, in theory, this could, um, with some work, can crawl through each of those. Okay, so can you use real devices while running your tests? And if not, what simulators do you suggest for different operating systems? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could do both. So um, at least with the Android, well, even iOS, what it does is that, you know, it just detects whatever devices that you have um, access to, whether it's a plugged in device or you, you tell it which simulator to run, run against. Um, simulators, I think, you know, I get this question a lot. Um, for my in my current role at my job is you know people wonder if it's better to test on uh, emulators or simulators as opposed to real devices and I say yes and no yes it's perfect for 
um, you know, as part of your CI, uh, continuous integration testing that your application is working correct, but you always want to run it on a real device, I think, prior to any release or devices to make sure that it actually can work and um, that your application can work and function correctly on real devices as well. Is the performance in real time, uh, is it for every second or millisecond? Um, it is between, it's, I forget what I have it, 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 it spaced out. It's after every action. So it, every, after it does every click or any type of gesture or any type of action, it, it records a performance. So as soon as it does something, if your application it then records and captures it to then see what the performance is of the action that you just did. Okay, next question. Uh, is this tool more of a UI automation testing tool or an exploratory testing tool? Um, well, a little bit of both. So it's not, well, it's not, it's, I don't know how you would say this. It's automated automation, I guess. Automated UI automation or automated automated UI automation. So I call it exploratory testing because that's what I've tried to achieve with this. You know, depending on what your definition of exploratory testing could be different than mine or, you know, everybody has their definitions. Um, I call it ex automated exploratory testing because I was trying to automate what I would normally do if I was given an application and I had to just, you know, if I'm manually going through each screen, uh, each view to see if I see any issues or just overall the functionality of the application. Okay, I have. I hope I get the next question right because it's uh, it's long and and it's and it spans uh, and it spans actually two questions uh, that I need to combine. Uh, so here goes. I'm giving it my best shot. Is it possible uh, to uh, make it learn the functionality of an app by tracking user actions and then using this knowledge via AI to perform exploratory testing as a as a way to get from assert and in order to be more dynamic to make it learn. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, so those are things I want to research more. Um, so if any machine learning engineers are out there that are interested in helping with this, that would be an awesome thing to explore more. Um, but yeah, in theory, it should be definitely possible for it to learn um, in um, your actions and what to do and create test, test cases off of that. Next question. In case you test an app that supports multiple languages, like in your demo, how can you overcome this issue by using Google API, as you mentioned in, in your talk? Um, so, sorry, can you repeat it again real quick, Eddie? Yeah, sure, of course. In case you test an app that supports multiple languages, like in your demo, how can you overcome uh, this issue by using Google API, as you mentioned in your talk? Oh, right. Yeah, so you, since you have access to, to the DOM, you can, you, can, you can parse the strings from your application, and then you can take those strings and you can run them against you know, Google API to give you back whether the language is correct based on whatever language you have set for your application. Hopefully that answered your question. I hope so too. So uh, I think those are all the questions uh, that we had. Um, so, and we are uh, coming close to the end of the hour. Uh, so uh, I want to thank everyone that joined us uh, today for this live session. And of course, uh, thank you, Justin, for this uh, in-depth pre uh, presentation. I got a lot of questions, so I just wanted to remind you that the link to the recording and Justin's uh, slide deck will be emailed to you by Friday. And I hope to see you all at our next event.